Here we have a molecule of benzene. And again, now I'm going to try to redraw that molecule a little bit more realistically, showing some of the orbitals that uh, the molecule consists of. Okay, so I've tried to draw the uh, six-membered ring a little bit more realistically. Uh, this shading down here is supposed to indicate that these two carbons over here are pointing towards you. They're in front of the molecule, and these two carbons back here are pointing away from you behind the blackboard. All of these carbons are sp2 hybridized. That means that they all have p orbitals that are perpendicular to the sigma bonds. So I've drawn all of those p orbitals in. All of these are p orbitals. Uh, I'm not going to draw the hydrogens just for simplicity. I've just drawn the p orbitals, but we won't draw the hydrogens. Each of these carbons also has a hydrogen, but we won't draw that. Um, and then this pi bond consists of two electrons. This pi bond consists of two electrons, and this pi bond consists of two electrons. So we have a bonding interaction for this pi bond, for this pi bond, and for this pi bond. But you can see that's kind of an artificial way of looking at it. It's true that we have an overlap between these two p orbitals, but we also have an overlap between these two p orbitals over here. It seems like there should be an interaction shown between these two p orbitals and between these two p orbitals in front and between these two p orbitals over here as well. Well, that's true, and that's reflected in the other resonance form of benzene. Here's the other form of benzene, and in this resonance form of benzene, we're focusing on the interactions between these two carbons over here and between the two at the bottom, and between these two on the left. So we can see that this picture is really maybe superior to either of these two resonance forms by themselves. If you only look at this resonance form, it seems like uh, there's only, uh, it seems like there's more bonding character between these two carbons than between these two. Um, and if you look at this re uh, resonance form, it looks like there's more bonding character between these two carbons than between these two. But in reality, everything is symmetric. Uh, so where are the electrons? The electrons are all spread out among all of these side-to-side -side overlapping p orbitals. The electrons are spread out among all of these p orbitals. Uh, what do we call electrons that are spread out among side-to-side -side overlapping p orbitals? We call them pi electrons. So all of these electrons here would be called pi electrons. Not just because they're in pi bonds, but for the deeper reason that, again, they're spread out among all these side-to-side -side overlapping p orbitals. So here we have a molecule that is completely conjugated, because not only do we have three or more overlapping p orbitals, but we have side-to-side -side overlapping p orbitals at every atom in the ring. All right, and now we can explain uh, one of the other uh, rules that we've learned. We've learned that uh, you can only be aromatic or anti-aromatic if you're flat. If you're non-flat, then you are non-aromatic. Um, and the reason for that is tied up with being completely conjugated. You can't really be completely conjugated unless the molecule is flat. Remember that completely conjugated means side-to-side -side overlap of p orbitals at every atom in the ring. Well, you can only have all of your p orbitals overlapping if the molecule is flat. You can see that I've drawn this molecule of benzene as flat, and you can see that all of these p orbitals have complete side-to-side -side overlap. They're all parallel to each other, so this orbi uh, p orbital completely overlaps with this one over here and this one over here. If the molecule were not flat, we could not have that complete overlap between all the atoms in the ring. Let me draw you a picture to show why that is. Now, here's another picture of a six-membered ring. But you can see that unlike this six-membered ring, this six-membered ring up here is not flat. In fact, you might recognize that this is the shape that's called the boat shape. 
So here we have a flat six-membered ring, uh, and here we have a boat-shaped six-membered ring. Now let's draw in the p orbitals. Well, here's two p orbitals. And you can see that these two p orbitals are overlapping just fine. And here's some p orbitals. And those p orbitals are overlapping just fine. But what about the p orbitals up here? So because these two carbons at the ends are not in the same plane as the other carbons, these two p orbitals are not going to be parallel to the other p orbitals. And you can see that we're no longer going to have a complete side-to-side -side overlap between the p orbitals. This p orbital over here is not parallel to these two p orbitals down here, so it cannot have a complete side-to-side -side overlap between them. Whereas, again, obviously when the molecule is flat, all of the p orbitals are com uh, completely parallel to each other and we can have complete side-to-side -side overlap. All right, so again, remember that in order to be either aromatic or non-aromatic, you have to be completely conjugated. And if you are not completely conjugated, then the molecule is non-aromatic. Well, now we can see why the molecule has to be flat. Uh, because if the molecule is not flat, it can't be completely conjugated. When a molecule is not flat, it cannot be completely conjugated. Because when the molecule is not flat, the p orbitals can't all be overlapping with each other. Now, we can still have a p orbital at every atom in the ring. This has a p orbital at every atom in the ring. But remember that con completely conjugated does not just require a p orbital at every atom in the ring. It requires side-to-side -side overlapping p orbitals at every atom in the ring. Well, these atoms up here do have p orbitals, but they don't have complete side-to-side -side overlap with the other atoms in the ring. So when you're not flat, you can't be completely conjugated. So now we understand um, why we have this requirement that the molecule be flat. Because if it were not flat, it couldn't be completely conjugated either. Uh, so actually, that kind of tells us that um, if we wanted to be real sticklers, we don't actually have to include the word flat in the definition of aromatic or non-aromatic or anti-aromatic because that's actually kind of redundant. Um, we know that we know that when a molecule is completely conjugated, it's either aromatic or anti-aromatic, and if it's not completely conjugated, it's just non-aromatic, a regular molecule. And technically speaking, we don't have to, uh, now we don't really have to include whether the molecule is flat or not. Uh, because suppose the molecule is not flat. Well, if it's not flat, then we now know that that means it can't be completely conjugated because the p orbitals can't be overlapping uh, with each other. And if a molecule is completely conjugated, we know already that it's flat. We don't have to add that as separate. Uh, it couldn't be completely conjugated in the first place unless it was flat because unless it's flat, we can't get the side-to-side -side overlap of all the atoms in the ring. Okay, so what I tried to explain here um, is why we have this requirement. Uh, why, what I've tried to explain here is why a molecule that's not flat um, is non-aromatic. And the reason is that when it's not flat, it can't be completely conjugated. By the way, I've been using the word flat, but oftentimes uh, your instructor might use the word planar instead. So I probably should have mentioned before that planar is a synonym for flat. Uh, because a plane is something that is flat. Uh, so um, if you want to, instead of using the, uh, the terms flat and non-flat, you could use planar and non-planar. Uh, but again, uh, what we've seen here is that when a molecule is non-planar or not flat, it can't be completely conjugated. Uh, and in order to be completely conjugated, then if we know a molecule is completely conjugated, we know it must be planar. That is, it must be flat. So again, remember that in this part of the videos, I'm trying to give you um, a, a slightly deeper understanding of the material that we talked about. Rather than now just using rules, I'm trying to explain a little bit why the rules work. So what we've explained so far um, is um, we've explained why uh, we have this exception to the hybridization rule. We've explained why if you have a lone pair and you're connected to another sp2 atom, you would also want to be sp2. The reason is that that allows uh, the molecule to have more conjugation. 
and we now under, have a deeper understanding of the idea that conjugation is when we have side-to-side -side overlap of p orbitals at three or more atoms in the ring. And also now we understand why in order to be aromatic or not, or uh, in order to be aromatic or anti-aromatic, you have to be flat. Because otherwise you can't be completely conjugated. You can't have that overlap of all the p orbitals in the ring. Now there's one more big thing that we haven't explained, which is that we haven't explained the 4n plus 2 rule. We haven't explained why having 4n plus 2 pi electrons makes you very stable and makes you aromatic, and why having uh, 4n pi electrons makes you very unstable and anti-aromatic. Uh, so that's the, the logical next and last topic for us to talk about.